wasn't just another revolutionary. He wasn't just another hippie. He was not just another great man. He was God in the flesh. And oh, the ethics that he taught. Never a man spake like that man. When you get hit on one side, he says, turn the other cheek. He never said what to do after that. But he did say, forgive 70 times seven, count that up. Jesus taught that we're to forgive. He taught a revolution in the way we're to live. He taught us that it wasn't just our outward actions that God judges, but it's the inward thoughts and intents. And he dragged and lifted and hauled that cross. He didn't squirm, he didn't yell, he didn't scream. He just took it and said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When he died on that cross, they nailed him. They put the nails in his hands. And you know what he said? Forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive them. Could you forgive somebody that's putting nails in your hands and you know you didn't deserve it? Then look at the death he died. Did ever a man die like Jesus? The lightning flashed and the thunder roared and the earth began to shake. And even the soldiers confessed that this must be the Son of God. Any one that can see Jesus on that cross and not be touched has a heart of stone. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he dropped his head and said, it's finished. What did he mean? He meant your plan of salvation is finished. God can now forgive you of all your sins because Jesus had finished God's plan for your salvation. Because you see, God knows every one of you by name. He has the hands of your head numbered. So when you see that, one of the things that has to come to mind is he's my savior, right? Right? He's my savior. And if you don't say that, then you realize something, that you don't really take what he did for you. He's my savior. He died for me. He died for my sins. And it's interesting, in the world that we live today, they don't want to talk about sin. You know? And sometimes people say to me, you know, you talk about sin a lot because sin's a problem. It's what keeps us from getting to God. And if you look at the world today, the world wants us to rejoice in sin. They want to say that sin is okay. They want to say that, you know what, just love me the way I am. And realize something, Jesus died on the cross the way you were so that you could be changed by what he did. And I think that's the most powerful thing when you look at that video and you think about um, the title of it is Forgive. He went to the cross knowing that his blood was going to be shed for me, right? Me, right? And the powerful part of that is that, you know what, even if it was just me, he would have did it. And when you see that, you think about that, and that's a depiction of it. What it looked like, the Bible says he was beaten beyond recognition. Okay, what, what he looks like, what, you know, and, and the thing is, the blood that poured, flowed down from him, that was for forgiveness of our sins. When we take communion, we, we take the, the Jews, right? We take the, the great drink and we drink it and say, this is his blood and we do it in remembrance of him. Yeah. What a great God. What an incredible God. The people are down here for, you know, they were down here for 4th of July and now we're, we're past the 4th of July and we talk about freedom. But real freedom isn't what our country fought for. Real freedom is what Christ did on the cross. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? And realize that, that that's what we're talking about. The freedom we're talking about is knowing that you're saved, knowing that you are forgiven of your sins, knowing that today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, today. Because nobody's guaranteed tomorrow, nobody. I may not be here tomorrow, right? I've only been hit a number of times, okay? And when you're, when you're hit by a car the first time, you figure, people say, why don't you stay off the bike? That's going to keep me from dying, right? 
stand off a bite so they can keep me from dying. See, I can live in fear, or I can say, you know what, I trust God. What Jesus did, even going to the cross, you know what? He trusted what his father was going to do. He trusted the plan of salvation. Is that not powerful? He put his trust in the plan that the father put in motion so that we could be his children. Amen? Amen. So that's, I feel like I already preached this morning. So um, that said, I'm going to just go through some announcements on the third page of your bulletin if you'll open it up. Tomorrow night we do have Bible study. We're going through the book of James. You're more than welcome to join us for that. Um, uh, we're, I think we made it to like verse 13, I believe, or 15, one of, one of those verses. So, um, uh, Also, our next pancake breakfast is on the 12th of, of August, and um, just keep that in prayer. Our VBS program will be the 7th through the 11th of August. Um, keep the kids, keep the teachers, keep everyone who's involved in it in prayer. We, we definitely need that. And if you're interested in helping, you can talk to Tony, see Tony. And then also, um, we... <laughs> Laura Keith runs our Grief Share program, and she's going to start up uh, another group for um, this fall. If you're interested in this, and if you've lost someone, if you're struggling with loss, if you're you're dealing with um, just the, the heartbrokenness that comes with that, it's a great program to deal with. And please, um, think about it. It's a biblical-based program, and they work together through it. She's got the right attitude for it, so just please, if you're interested in doing that, um, let you can talk to me. You can grab one of the brochures, scan a QR code. They'll give you the information about it. You're welcome to, to, to be part of that as well. And then also, um, our next wave, um, George and Pam were here last night. And we sat out here for, for two hours before we decided to cancel it. And we knew if we canceled it, it wouldn't rain. If we, if we did, did cancel it, then it wouldn't rain. Well, it didn't rain because we canceled it. So, um, but um, our next wave will be on the 22nd. So just keep that in prayer that we have good weather for it as well. Our service time will stay at 10 o'clock until we get to Labor Day. After Labor Day weekend, after Labor Day weekend, we'll move back to probably 9:30 again. And then let's see. Um, Dave is starting a Bible study. It actually starts this week, right, Dave? See what happens when I catch one stop it. Okay, talk about the date. Okay, so if you're interested in being part of that, you can you can see Dave after service. So um, just talk to him. And um, the, the grief share information is the bottom, too, if you just want to connect to the website. I think that pretty much covers what I need to cover other than the T-shirts. We do have T-shirts. I didn't wear it this, this, this Sunday, but if you're interested in our T-shirts or polo shirts, there's some in the back. Um, you can see Darlene. And um, let's get up and pass the piece. Defibrillator. Oh, right. And if you're interested in donating, we're, we're purchasing a defibrillator. If you're interested in donating towards that, please just throw it in the offering plate. We'd appreciate it. Let's get up and pass the piece of God one other this morning. Yeah, I, I knew which one it was. So we're going to do the call to worship. If you're able to stand with me this morning, please stand, and we'll do it. I'll read non-bold, you read bold. Christ calls those who are weary and heavy, heavy laden. Christ calls us to bear his yoke and learn from him. Christ is gentle and humble in heart. Come, for Christ calls us here. So this morning we're going to have worship, and Pam and George are going to lead us. So we're going to do the first song. We're going to take a break between the first song, do praise requests, then do second songs. You're not going anywhere. I'm just going to ask for praises, okay? So And then we'll, we'll go forward. We've had a lot of discussion about this this morning. I just want to make sure he's not. we're on the same page. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs> praise the Lord. We're going to make it up as we go along. Thank the Lord. We thank the Lord for this uh, great blessing of uh, being here to, um, well, just to worship you out loud and hopefully uh, point everybody's hands, hearts, and eyes toward the Lord this morning. And uh, we'll praise you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Have you been to Jesus for a cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace is sour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as no, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 
Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as no, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bride? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as no, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Yeah. Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. Amen. <laughs> so does anyone have anything they want to share that God's done in your life this week? <laughs> Nobody? God's done. Get, get, get a choice. Yeah. Amen. Uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. What is she? Who, who's she to you? Granddaughter. Okay. So first grand. Okay. Your first grandchild. Well, we are glad to have you with us. So, um, <laughs> Because we've met her, we've met her youngest daughter, and it's hard to believe that's her youngest daughter. So okay, but that's great. So anybody, anything else you want to share? Okay, Mike. Praise the Lord for bringing us all together. Amen. 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 Any day, any day we can get together and worship is a great day. So get get Larry. Yes, Bart, Bart had his surgery. They replaced a couple of the valves, and um, he had a little pain in the first day or two, but he's doing incredible. She actually just texted me this morning, and I even told him that we expect him to be running um, by the end of this week. So, um, but she said that he laughed. He thought that was funny, and, and, and he's doing well, which is a praise. Um, we're expecting God to heal him quickly, and he's going to get through this very quickly. So just keep him in prayer. So get him. Revelation 21 and 4. Uh, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Mm. Neither shall be mourning, crying, or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mark. Yes, get Liz. I have waited for such a good day for us to have the family here and God back. Yep. Is he here? He's our she's Angelica, every day my prayer is not for tomorrow. But today, I pray for you every day. Today's miracle. You're today's miracle, okay? Every day you're waking up and every day you're spending that day, God's answering prayer. It's today's miracle. You're today's miracle today, okay? And that's all we're looking at. We're not worried about tomorrow, just today, okay? So you're a miracle today. Having you here has been a miracle again, and praise God for that. Amen. We love having you, sweetheart. <laughs> Anybody, anything else? Good.
Yes. Yeah. He, uh, Michael overdosed this week, and, and I, I didn't ask you guys um, any update. How is he doing? Is it um, is there brain damage? Uh, that's praise. So okay. So he. We'll just keep him in prayer. He's he's battled fentanyl. He's been having issues with it. He overdosed again. But we just need to keep them in prayer, especially Michael, that he'll break this addiction. That God will break him from that cycle of addiction. He just keeps going back to it. And for parents, it's hard to watch your kid go through this time and time again. So we pray for them as well. So let's do that right now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, Lord. We just pray for Michael. We pray that, Lord, you would just put in his spirit that he has to be a get away from this stuff, that he needs to, to change his life, and that, Lord, you'll just break him of, of this addiction. And, Lord, we pray for Jerry and Ada, that, Lord, you just put your hand upon them, give them strength, give them courage, get them through today, and just be with them. And then, Lord, we pray for Angelica as well. We just pray for her today. This would be a great day for her to be able to celebrate it, rejoice in it and have a good time in it. And Lord, we also, uh, Lord, we do, we pray for George as well. We know um, just with his diagnosis as well, we just pray that good reports, Lord, one good report after another, we just ask that you put your hand upon him as well. Lord, let him get through this. And Lord, we just lift up those who are here this morning that might need a touch from you. Lord, they're sitting there right now and they want to hear from God. Lord, we pray that you would move. You move in power. That Lord, you are the God who can do all things. That we know that when we touch with your spirit, when we move with your spirit, that Lord, you're capable of the impossible. And we pray for that right now for those who need a touch from you, that you would meet them right where they're at and make that happen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, I said we're going to sing our next hymn this morning, or next song this morning, so get George and Pam, go at it. Though great and awesome are your signs, I could not see that I was blind. Though I had ears, I could not hear you. But even on my darkest day, no storm could chase the sun away. Though I may fall on my ways near you. You are hope for the hopeless. You are strength for the weakest of us. You are friend to the friendless. Bring the best out in the worst of us. New are your mercies every day. So humbled we received your grace Though we were sinners still you loved us No greater love is any friend To die that we might live again Each perfect gift is from above us You hope for the hopeless you are strength for the weakest of us you are friend to the friendless bring the best out in the worst of us you are hope for the hopeless you are strength for the weakest of us you are friend to the friendless bring You are unchanging, you are forever, you are provider, you are light in the darkness, you are redeemer, you are almighty. 
eulogy. You are beloved. You are the one who saves us. You are the one who saves us. Yeah. You are hope for the hopeless. You for the weakest of us you are friend to the friendless bring the best out in the worst of us you are hope for the hopeless you are strength for the weakest of us you are friend to the friendless bring the best out in the worst of us you can take a seat this morning. We're going to take the offering. So if I could have our ushers come forward. Okay. Stand again. They've got a couple more songs for us to do this morning. So we've got lots more. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> Lord, we're grateful that no matter what's going on, that you are always with us. We just love that about you, Lord, that you're alive, that you're living, and that you are faithful, God, to answer our prayers. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near, and I will fear no evil, for my God is with me, and if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh, no, you'll never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh, no, you'll never let go in every high and every low. Oh, no, you'll never let go, Lord. You'll never let go of me. I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. And there will be an end to these troubles until that day comes. Um, dude, I'm going to start that again. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. A glorious light beyond all compare. Sorry. And there will be an end to these troubles. But until that day comes, we'll live to see you here on the earth. And I will fear no evil. For my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh, no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh, no, you never let 
go in every high and every low. Oh, no, you'll never let go, Lord. You'll never let go of me. Oh, no, you'll never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh, no, you'll never let go in every high and every low. Oh, no, you'll never let go, Lord. You'll never let go of me. I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. And there will be an end to these troubles. But until that day comes, still I will praise you. Still I will praise you. Yes, I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on and there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes still I will praise you still I will praise you oh no you never let go through the calm and through the storm oh no you never let in every high and every low oh, no you never let go Lord you never let go of me oh no you never let go through the calm and through the storm oh no you never let go in every high and every low oh no you never let go Lord, you never let go of me. Oh, no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh, no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh, no, you never let go, Lord. You never let go of me. 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 God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he bled and died to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still the 
come assurance this child can face uncertain days because Christ lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he All fear is gone Because I know He holds the future And life is worth the living Just because He lives And then one day I'll cross that river I'll find life's final war with pain And then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know my Savior lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone Just because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know. Just because he lives And life is worth the living Just because he lives And life is worth the living Just because he lives and life is worth the living just because Christ lives. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin and 
left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone Cause Jesus paid it all All to him I owe See left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow and when before the throne I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He Washed it white as snow Cause Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Sin had left a crimson stain He Washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Oh, praise the one who saved not dead and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, as we look into your word, we, what we ask is that your Holy Spirit would just descend upon us, that, Lord, we would just feel the presence as a group here this morning, that um, it wouldn't just be individually, but that we as a whole would just experience that power that you have, the love that you have for us, and that, Lord, as we look at your word, it would just speak to us in a way maybe we haven't heard it before. We ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we're looking at Revelation chapter 2. You guys can take a seat. And so we're looking at Revelation chapter 2. This gets into the churches, and I, I mentioned this last week. We're now going to be dealing with the churches, and in dealing with the churches, um, there's something to keep in mind here, and you have to remember that um, th this concept of what we looked at at the end of chapter 1 is it's not only just back when this was happening, but it's also for today. So when he's talking to the churches, we have to look at ourselves and evaluate ourselves. And it's interesting because the world that we live in today, the church is all over the place, okay? The, ch the church is, is, is a mess. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, there's just all kinds of things going on. 
um, in churches. And the church should be centered on God's word. It should be founded and centered and, and focused because that's what Christ is all about. He said he's the word, so that's what we do. So when he's talking, and we looked at chapter 1, it's Christ who's talking here, right? And remember the picture that we had is, where's Christ at? Where's Christ at in that picture that we saw? There's seven lampstands, right? Yes. And he's standing where? Yes. Right in the center of it because he's right with his church, right? And then he saw the seven stars. The seven stars represent what? The angels, right? This, the, the, there's an angel for each church, so you're going to see that picture. So when he gets into this and he's going to talk, talk about the church, the first church he's going to talk about is he's going to talk about the church at Ephesus. Now, it's interesting because we have a book that was written to the Ephesians, right? And think about that book. That book talks about an awful lot of things. One of the things that stands out to me about that book is um, it talks about the wall that was built in, in, in Israel. They had a wall to kind of keep the Gentiles in one area. So when they were worshiping, Israel was closer, and they were kind of partitioned off by that wall. But that wall was taken out in Ephesians chapter 2 so that everyone would have access to worship God. That's what Christ had done. And as you move through the, that book, you get into the chapter 3, and it says, every, no eye is seen or ear is heard, right? The incredible things that God has in store for us. So he tells the church this, and he goes through these various things. But then you get into chapter 4 and chapter 5. Chapter 5 is interesting because he talks about husband and wives, okay? He talks about the relationship between a husband and wife. And when you look at that, he says that basically that relationship should be like us and Christ, and you really look at that. It's one of, the, one of the key things about marriage relationships. A marriage relationship, the husband is supposed to make the bride, right, more beautiful. You got that? I can't hear a yes or amen or praise, okay? I expect a little bit of praise the Lord. The husband is supposed to make the wife more beautiful. It doesn't mean he goes into the bathroom with her and takes the makeup and goes, let me paint your face, okay? That's not what he's talking about here. My wife would really hate me if I did that, okay? But I can tell you, what it is is the attitude that you have towards your wife should build her up, okay? Because you should be focused on who? Husbands. You should be focused on? No. Christ, okay? Should be focused on Christ. Maybe we should go through Ephesians first. Let's open there. Now, so you, you should be focused on Christ, okay? Because your attitude towards Christ will reflect on to who? Your wife, okay? And your wife wants that. Because what it's interesting is because you're focused on Christ, your wife, who already has a loving heart, okay, now will, and the word a lot of people don't like is submit, okay? She'll submit to you. Why? Because the same way we're supposed to submit to Christ. You got that? Because of, out of that love. So you've got that in the book. You've got that picture. He talks about the church in chapter 5 in connection to the relationship of marriage. God wants you to be part of his family. You got that? And so as we look at the church, he's talking about being part of the family. And, and I want to stress this here because the Ephesians, you know, and it, interesting, this morning, I, I usually take an hour to kind of prepare. And this morning was not one of those mornings, okay? Just one thing happened after another and, and, and everything. Even this morning, my dog came in. Um, when Krista, Krista left for work early this morning, so when the sun comes up, the dog decides it's time for me to get up, okay? And, and this morning, I didn't really want to get up when he wanted me to get up. So he jumps on the other side of the bed. Because I turn over, and he licks me on that side of the face. So I roll back over, and he jumps over me again on that side. I'm like, you know, stop. I want to sleep a little bit longer. And his tail is wagging, and he's so happy. I'm like, how could I not be happy? So I'm like, okay, you want to go out? I'm going to let you out. Okay. So went down. But I kept thinking, imagine this. You, you, you have this love, this incredible love that God has given us, and he's demonstrated in Christ, and he calls us in that relationship, and, and when I was thinking, my wife wasn't there this morning because she's already going to work, I kept thinking, you know, we're called to love one another, and as husband and wives, that love is supposed to be different than the love that you have for your kids, because your kids, okay, realize something, your kids are going to move out and leave eventually, some, some may stay a lot longer, okay, my dad has experienced that with some of my brothers, okay, but you realize that what happens is a husband clings to his wife, right? And the two of them together are supposed to focus on Christ. And that's the relationship we're supposed to have. So the Ephesian church is supposed to know that, right? Their first love should be what? Christ. Their focus should be Jesus. So when they look, when they look 
at what God says, their focus, should, they always should remember is that my relationship, see, a marriage works so much better when the husband is committed to Christ and serving Christ and the wife is committed to Christ and serving Christ because they're not just serving themselves, they're serving Christ. And see, the Ephesian church got this. And it's interesting, they're the first church he talks to, right? This is the first church. In Revelation chapter 2, we get the first church he talks to. And he's going to talk to the church that's supposed to know about this relationship because he wrote to them. And so it says here, this is to the angel in the church of Ephesus, right? The final. Oh, I want one more thing. The book of Ephesians finishes with what? It finishes with wearing the armor of God, right? Spiritual warfare. You got that? I, I just want to make sure you, you get this point. Um, we have the police out front. Is everything okay? Okay. So I just saw the police out front. Okay. Um, so <laughs> that's good. So you've got the, you've got the church at Ephesus, right? And what they they have the spiritual the spiritual basis is what it's on the idea of you protect yourself from these things that are going on spiritually, and you put on the full armor of God. Okay. And so that's it. So and it's interesting this that. As you look at this, and we're all focused on the police officers, that's all great. I'm just making sure nobody's hurt. Um, so as you see this, I want to get into Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. It says, To the angel in the church of Ephesus write the following. This is the solemn pronouncement of the one who has a firm grasp on the seven stars in his right hand. So he's talking about Christ, right? What's Christ got in his right hand? Seven stars. What are they? The angels. We saw that in chapter 1, right? It's the seven angels. So he's saying the one who has control here, the ultimate control is who? So he's going to say, look, I'm going to look at you guys. I'm going to judge you guys. And this is the interesting thing is when we have to look at ourselves and judge ourselves, we don't like this. Okay? Whenever we got to judge ourselves for how we're acting, what we're doing, we really don't like it. We like to judge other people, right? Isn't it fun to judge other people? Look at that idiot, right? <laughs> You want to go outside, you just sit outside for about 10 minutes, the car goes the wrong way. And we can all agree, look at that idiot, right? <laughs> right? We're all in agreement. When that guy's going the wrong way, we're like, that's an idiot, right? And it's interesting because I just read this thing this week, a little side note here, is now they're talking about how to make it so that we don't have people going the wrong way during the season. Okay. Well, we've got one-way signs all over the place, right? And I was riding my bike on Thursday, and this guy turns out, makes a right going up 35 north and he's coming towards me oh. got two cars and him so first thing I said was God I really kind of need your help right now <laughs> because what happens is he's coming this way and I'm yelling you're going the wrong way do you ever notice that people don't care if they're going the wrong way they don't. They don't. and as much as it's blatant in the car I realized today that when you tell people they're going the wrong way they're not following Christ you know what they would do or leave me alone Right? Don't bother me. I'm okay. Realize, it's so typical of going the wrong way that people go, I'm all right. It's like the old guy who's flying down 95. Okay? He's flying down 95. He calls his wife. It's Carl, probably. Carl calls his wife and says, honey, all these idiots on 95 are going the wrong way, and they're flying. Marilyn turns the TV on, and there she sees a, a, a helicopter with an overshot view, and there's Carl on 95 going the wrong way, right? <laughs> you can tell Carl that later when you see him. But you've got this. We, we're, we're headed, so many people are headed the wrong way, and instead of listening to the pronouncements here, they keep going the wrong way. Here you've got Jesus saying, look, I'm going to point out if you're going the wrong way. You got that? He wants you to acknowledge that sometimes you're going the wrong way and you need to be woken up. We live in a world today that needs to wake up. Okay? And I'd love to use the term woke, right? Right? Isn't that funny? They need to wake up because guess what? They don't understand that God's calling them to change, repent, go the other direction. So he says, look, I've got them. And he says, the one who walks among the seven lampstands, verse 2, I know your works. So Jesus knows exactly what you're doing. I also know your labor, okay, and your steadfast endurance. See, he says, I know you've put up. I know you put up with a lot of stuff. See, this can speak to us today, right? I don't know about you, but, man, you turn the TV on, you listen to stuff, you go on the Internet. No matter what happens, all this garbage gets thrown at you. Garbage all over the place. I even saw a billboard the other day that just, I was like, are you kidding me? And as you see this, you, you go, he says, look, your steadfast endurance that you cannot tolerate what? You got it, evil. Today, guess what we're called to do? 
I'm saying, you know what? I'm not putting up with evil anymore. I'm not going to put up with it. He's saying to the church at Ephesus, Ephesus, you know what? you got to keep on going that direction. Don't tolerate evil. You've even been put to the test that those who refer to themselves as apostles, but they're not. See, they're people claiming that they're God's teachers, okay? That God specifically put them in that role to guide and direct, okay? They're not. And have discovered they're false. Guess what we need to do today? We make, need to make sure that we're looking at God's word and studying God's word and know what God's word says. Because people throw all kinds of stuff out there today. And they want you to say, oh, it's all right. It's all right to do this, and it's all right to do that. And, and this feels good, and that feels good. Realize something. I said this before. It's not a mat matter of how it feels. It matters whether you're obedient or not. Okay? True happiness only comes when you're obedient. And we talked about this in Bible study. I, so many people will say to me, but God just wants me to be happy. Tell me where in Scripture you ever find that, right? Yeah. You ever find that the Bible says God just wants you to be happy? No, and I have people when they're divorcing their spouse, you know, they say, well, God just wants to be happy. And I'll say, no, he doesn't. He's not worried about your happiness. Okay? What's he worried about? Obedience. Your obedience. Right? You made a commitment to that person. What's he saying? <coughs> be obedient. You don't like it, so you're going to say, but I'm not happy. Okay? I realize something. You're not going to be happy with the next person either. Okay? Because, look, we're all flawed. Did you ever notice that? We're all flawed. I've never met a perfect person yet. You sit with people sometimes and you realize we're not perfect, okay? And even our best thoughts towards people, they're not always what they really are. But God is who he says he is, and he's going to do what he's going to do. And realize, when you look at Scripture, you've got to stand on what Scripture says. Now you get to verse 3, okay? He says, I am also aware you persisted steadfastly. See, he knows the effort you put in. If you're a Christian who's spending time in God's Word and getting closer to God, and you want to know God more, he knows exactly what you're doing. Okay? You, you don't have to worry about telling everybody. You don't have to scream out, I'm a Christian! Okay? Or have that bumper sticker in the back of your car to testify. What you need to do is live it. Be obedient. Share Christ with other people. Okay? Endured much for the sake of whose name? Jesus' name, right? See, he's not saying just God. He's saying who? Jesus. I, I want to make sure you stress this. He's saying to the Ephesian church, for the sake of whose name? Because people talk about God today. Oh, I, I know God. No. Whose name? Jesus. Jesus' name. See, this is so important when you listen to how he's talking to the church. He's making it clear to the church. See, he doesn't judge the nations here. He judges the church. Judgment starts with the church. You got that? It starts with us. And whose name do we live by? We live by Jesus' name. And there's not a sweeter name, is there? When you know that you're redeemed, you say the name Jesus. You know what? You're saved by that. And he says, look, and have not grown weary. You've got to fight the good fight. Okay? Don't get tired. See, don't get drawn into the arguments. All the stuff that's going on today, they want you to argue all this stuff. They want you to, see, they'd rather have you not talk about Jesus and argue about all the screwed up stuff that's going on in the world today. That's what they're doing. They're, they're taking, if you've watched just the news cycles now, watch what's happening. They want you to keep talking. They keep throwing things in the mix so that you'll talk about that and you won't talk about Jesus. And realize, what does Christ want us to talk about? Him. The only way people get saved is we talk about Christ. Okay? Look, the transgender stuff, all the stuff that's going on, you can't fix all that. That's a spiritual problem, right? That's a spiritual mess. You can't fix it. You've got to pray. But at the same time, you've got to share Christ with people. You get to verse 4. Look what he says. He says, but I have this against you. See, the Ephesian church has been working. They've been doing all the things. But he says, look, you departed from what? Your first love. Love is so important here, right? Love is so important because everything we're supposed to do as a Christian is based on what? Love. And if you say you love God, right, then you're supposed to love your brother. He says you've lost, you departed from your first love. See, instead of really spending time with God, I mean, focused on God, and when people are brought into the congregation and brought into the body of Christ, you welcome with love. What happens is you're worried about other stuff, okay? Sometimes we're more worried about how we look than whether the person knows Christ. You ever notice that? Especially we, since we're here, you know, this morning I wore sandals instead of boots. And probably two people at least walking out of church will say to me, no boots? Okay? <laughs> Guarantee, no boots. And, and, but realize, as you sit here this morning, your first love is what? Is it Christ? What do you put first? What is first in your life? Is it Jesus? Would you be willing to say, you know what? Christ, whatever it takes, I'm willing to sacrifice that for you. See, I know when I got married, 
He talks about, you know, you, you love one another and you make all these commitments in one another. When you're married, you, you notice that, that, and I've done so many weddings over the years now, when, when you say it and you look in their eyes and I'm watching, I always make sure the couple is facing one another, okay? I make sure they're holding hands, that they don't break their hands, and they're looking right in each other's eyes. And so when, when I do the wedding ceremony, we work on the whole process of, of making sure that they are looking at one another so they make that commitment and they know who they're making a the commitment to, Okay? And, and you want that, right? You want a commitment. You don't want the person to say, well, you know what? I thought about it. I really don't like that. And I love it when somebody says, let's change the words. Okay? Let's change it. Let's make it sound a little bit different. <laughs> and whatever that was, it's fine. But it, realize, when we talk about changing the commitment, when you talk about love, you're making a, commit, a commitment to that person, not about feeling right. You understand, when you got married, it wasn't about feeling. It wasn't about how you looked. It wasn't about how healthy you're going to be. Because if I got married with that, it would have caused a lot of problems. Right? You don't go, I'm marrying you as long as you keep your looks. Right? I'm marrying you as long as you stay youthful looking. Okay? I'm marrying you as long as you stay pretty. Right? As long as you don't get fat. Right? Wouldn't that be great? That'd be the vows? Like, half an hour later, a lot of people are getting divorced. I don't know if it is. I saw the way you look. I saw our mom, right? <laughs> and you laugh, but you know what's funny? People sitting here and will tell me when I'm counseling them. You know what I saw? If I'd known her mom was like that, I would have never got married, okay? And we laugh because we know, you know what? Some of us think that sometimes. But he says love. What is love? Love is that commitment. See, what Christ showed us on the cross, and we just saw that this morning, right? He was committed, was he not? How committed was he? He committed to the point that he was beaten, bruised, beyond recognition for you because he loved you, okay? And he's saying you departed from your first love. Are you looking at Christ? Is everything through Christ? Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, right? And these other things will be added unto you. That's what he's saying here is you've departed from your first love. Get the first love. Christians today need to get back to the first love. Because the problem is, look, I've been married now. We made 33 years. Incredible when we made it 33 years. Look at it and, you know, and realize it's not been fun the whole time. 33 years. You know, I, I remember when we first got married. This is going to be great. This is going to be fun. It's not always been fun. She can tell you. You don't even have to ask me. You can, she can tell you. It's not always been fun. There's been rough patches. There's been times, you know what? You just look at each other and go, oh, you know, today? Yeah, today, yeah? And then what happens is then you have another day and you go, man, this is so great. And it's so great to have somebody that you know you can count on because they're committed to you. They're committed to loving you. Realize something. That's what God wants from us. He wants us to be committed to loving him. How do we do it? We show it by obedience. We show it by spending time in his word. We show it by spending time in prayer. We get committed to him. There's nothing better than when a couple says we're going to recommit to one another. It means we're going to say again that we love one another. When we redid our vows years ago, that was one of the things I said to her. I said, look, we're going to do this. What we're saying to one another is we're really committing ourselves to one another again to say this is exactly what we agreed to years ago. This is exactly what we want. That's what Christ is saying here. Look, you depart from your first love. Get back to it. And then he gets in verse 5. He says, look, therefore, remember what the high state you're falling from and repent. He's saying, look, you used to be up so close to me because you were seeking after me and going after me and following after me and being obedient to me. And what happened is because you've fallen away from that love, you're far away now. Turn back. Do the deeds you did at first. And he, what he's talking about is loving one another. You got that? Loving God and loving one another. In our world today, they don't want us to love one another. They want to be, us to be at odds at one another. I don't care what group you have disagreements with. Guess what? We're called to love our enemies. You got that? You even saw, Billy Graham said in the video, right? Jesus said, turn the other cheek, right? And he didn't say what to do afterwards. I thought that was so powerful because you think about it. We all want to think about what we're going to do next, right? But we're supposed to turn the other cheek, right? That's not easy, is it? Especially when somebody smacks you the first time, you're like, turn the other cheek. Why do you turn the other cheek? For what reason? So they can smack the other one. So you, that's, what you, that's exactly what he means. You got that? You turn the other cheek so he can smack the other one. And, and realize, today we want to go, wait a minute, it's my turn. See, the picture he's trying to get us here is, look, 
Turn back to your first love. Commit to the things he said. Do the deeds you did at first. If not, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. That is, if you do not repent. Turn from your ways. See, it's interesting. This is the first church he's talking to. Because guess what? They need to change. They need to get their heart right with Christ. Okay? So you see this. And I think it's a powerful thing because here it is. It's the lampstands are right around Christ, right? He's sitting in the center and he's talking to them. And he's saying, you've got to change. And if not, I'll take you out of there. I don't think there could be anything worse than knowing that you aren't part of what Christ is going to do. You talk about, you know, you talk about what we expect in heaven and what's going to happen. As we look through the rest of Revelation, this should stand in your mind. I want to get back close to Christ. Now, verse 6, it says, but you do have this going for you. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitan practices and the practices I also hate. They were believed that you could go and do all kinds of sexual things and do it with impunity. You could do whatever you wanted to do, however you wanted to do it, okay, outside of marriage, all those things. And they said, basically, you know what? I hate those things. You also hate those things. Because God talked to them about what marriage was, right? He talked to them what marriage. Marriage is what? One man and one? You sure it's not trans woman? Not trans guy? It's one man and one? woman, right? He made it clear, right? XX, XY, right? He made, isn't it interesting? He built it into your DNA so you can't confuse it. Isn't that great? The way God made it was he wrote it on your chromosomes so that, you know what? Inside you, you can't erase it. It's not subject to your opinion. You don't wake up this morning and say, I'm feeling a little girly today, right? <laughs> Imagine if the guys came in this morning and said, we're dressed up for our girly show this morning, right? <laughs> See, what he's saying is, I hate those things because I created you and I made you a certain way. That's it. Don't follow. Just because somebody says this is okay, don't follow it. Make sure it's obedient with God's word. He says in Nicolaitan, he, he, we're going to look at them when we get to verse 15. It's amazing what's going on there and what's happening with this. And he's saying to them that he understands they hate that because God... Jesus and his word spoke to them about what marriage is. See, marriage is about that relationship with Christ. That's the, the most important thing. When we got married, I didn't realize, like, when we got married, how important, really deep down important, that relationship to Christ is. Because in my relationship to Christ, I learn so much about love, and I learn so much about love from my wife. And I really didn't understand certain things about love. See, you, you come in with your precepts, you think you're going to do things, and when you get married, you know what? Things change, right? And I've said this before. You know the toilet paper has a certain direction it's supposed to roll, right? I didn't know that. She goes, you know, you put the toilet paper on the wrong way. I said, okay. So from this point forward, I leave the toilet paper out in the counter and say, it, this way it goes whatever way it's got to go. See, she taught me. She taught me well, right? Because I don't want to have to remember what direction went. It's too much pressure, right? When you're sitting on the toilet, it's too much pressure. Which direction does toilet paper go, right? See, but I think that's the thing he's saying to us. Are we willing to love God in the way that God wants us to love? And then you get to verse 7. It says, the one who has an ear had better hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will permit him to eat from the tree of life in paradise. So now, see, he's moving. He's moving on now. Okay, what is happening here is you look at this, he's moving to the next church. And as he's moving to the next church because he's finishing up with Ephesians, he says he just wants you to understand. As he speaks to this church, he wants you to hear, right? You have ears to hear, right? He wants you to hear. So he's not just talking to the Ephesian church because he's kind of making sure that all the churches understand this. If you have an ear, what are you supposed to do? Hear. Listen, right? Hear, listen. And he says we're blessed because we're reading this out loud. He says, to the one who conquers, right, I will permit him to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. See, there's a promise here. You persist, you stick with God, there is a place for you. You got it? You don't have to worry about what happens in this life. You don't have to worry about what happens to you. As long as you're trusting in Christ, there's a place for you. And then you get to verse 8. It says, 
to the angel in the church of Smyrna, write the following. So now he's talking to this next church. And it's interesting because this church, there's not a lot said to this church, okay? And so you've got this Smyrna church, and we don't know a, a, a tremendous amount about this church scripturally because it's not written of scripturally. We know that these churches were churches that, that Paul had founded. But you've got this Smyrna church, and it says, this is the solemn pronouncement of the one who is first and last, the one who is dead but came to life. So he's saying again, who's Jesus? Jesus is everything, right? First and last, you got that? He's everything. Who was dead? We know he died on the cross, right? And he's came to life, so we know he's alive, right? He's alive. The biggest thing that you've got is hope that he's alive. When you walk out of here today, the one thing you do is smile, right? My Savior's alive. My Savior's alive. And it's a promise to me that, you know what? I have life. I have life eternal because of what he's done. Okay, so he's talking to the church, his next church, and this is the second church, and as he gets into it, he goes, look, he says, I know the distress you're suffering from and your poverty, okay? So he says, I know the distress that you're suffering from and your poverty, but you are rich. See, realize, what do we base richness on? Money, property, everything else, right? Material stuff. But really, what's richness? Because anybody here, anybody here able to take stuff with them when they die? Okay, I remember when my mom died a couple years ago. One of the discussions we had was, you know, um, what she was going to wear. Okay, my mom is dead, so now my my sister started that discussion. What she's going to wear? I'm like, I, I really don't care. Then, but, but this dress or, or that dress, and I, I'm like, it's death. Okay, we're putting her in a casket. Dress is getting buried with her, right? And I said she can't even take the dress with her. The dress is going to stay in the casket. You got that? You can't, you can't take any. Think about it. All the stuff that you got. But I feel sorry for somebody someday because we've got a second house down. You know, we've got the parsonage here and we've got our house down in South Jersey. Somebody's going to have to go through our stuff. Okay? And realize they're going to go through your stuff and they're going to look at every single thing that you've got. Every single thing. They're going to look at your underwear. So throw out the dirty ones. Okay? They're going to throw out the ones with holes in it. All. Throw that stuff out, okay? But they're going to look at everything. Everything that you have, they're going to look at. And they're going to judge every single thing you've got. You know how I know? Because I've done it. When a few of my family members have died, guess what we do? Oh, look at this picture. What do you think, okay? Joy Grosko's um, son passed away a number of years ago, and she called me. We went over to the house, and when her, we found her son's body and, and when that all happened. But she asked me to come back and go through some of the stuff with her to help get rid of some of the stuff. And she found a notebook. He had plastic surgery. I can talk about this now that they're both gone. He had plastic surgery. And she says to me, I can't believe my son was so egotistical that he had to have a nose job and his face raised and everything. And he wasn't even 60 years old. And I remember sitting there laughing, going, boy, I bet you he's probably not happy wherever he's at now knowing that she's got this notebook in her hand, right? <laughs> Think about what stuff that you have that people are going to look at when you die, okay? Realize something. <laughs> that, that opinion that you've got out there, like we come to church and we're all dressed a certain way, okay, this is how I am. That's not what people see, okay? He says, look, this is the one who was, okay, the one who was dead, came back to life. What's your life going to say? Now, you get to, when you look at, and we move to verse 9, when we got to verse 9, it says, I know your poverty, I know your suffering, your distress, but I also know the slander against you by those who call themselves Jews and really are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. They're being attacked, okay? They're being attacked because of what they're standing for. And the Jews are coming after them and saying that, you know what? This is, what you're doing is wrong. See, they're standing in faith in Christ, and being accused of doing other things. And realize, a lot of times, you're going to stand with God and people are going to slander you. People are going to say things against you. And guess what? It's all right. It's all right. See, because you're standing for God. And when you're standing for God, that's it. He says, look, but you're rich. And the reason they're rich is because they're standing in Christ. Because what God has in store for them is like nothing on this earth. I was watching um, this morning. It's interesting. Jeff sent me this video, and I watched the video, and then I watched a couple other videos. But the one video he sent me, he said it reminded me of me, and I, I watched it, and I thought it was interesting because it talks about these cars. And ha when you die, the number of cars in your procession, the headlights in your procession, 
and how many car headlights are in the procession. And, I, and I'm watching it, I thought, it's amazing because I'm not worried about when I die, what my procession is like. I can't wait to get to heaven to see who's there waiting for me. See, I'm waiting for the people who are standing in line to say, man, we've been waiting for you to get here. Yeah. Right? I can't, that, I mean, I'm watching, I'm, I, I smiled, I, I listened to the song, and then I thought, man, then I watched this clip about Tim McGraw, and he owns his own private island in the Bahamas. Okay? And he owns his own private island because he's got to get away. He grew up poor, okay? Grew up poor, and his father was Tim you know, Tug McGraw and everything. But now he's got his own private island in the Bahamas. And the guy says at the end of the video, what do you think? I said, it's great to have an uh, island in the Bahamas, but when you die, guess what? Your kids get it. And I guarantee your kids are not going to treat it the way you treated it. Guarantee it. The one thing I've learned about people more than anything else is that when they get something that they didn't work for, they don't treat it right. Right? And realize something. The gift that God's given us in all these things, okay, is Christ. We've got to be obedient because we're rich. We're rich in what Christ has done for us. Now you get to verse 10, and he says, don't be afraid of things you're about to suffer. See, and I think this is interesting because we're supposed to suffer. At times, we're going to suffer, guys. I don't care what anybody tells you. At times, you're going to suffer, okay? He says, don't be afraid of things you're about to suffer. The devil is about to have some of you thrown into prison so you may be tested. And I thought about this a lot, man. Over the last couple of years, things have changed. Christians are not welcome like they used to be welcome, okay? And if you say certain things, especially pastors, you know, look, look at the way um, Facebook and other things censor when you talk about Christianity. I have a friend of mine right now who, he, you know, he can't say anything because his account's been censored time and time again because every time he talks about something about God, they censor him, okay? So he said, you know, I'm constantly in Facebook jail, which I think is interesting. I never thought that Facebook had a jail, but... Um, but when I look at this, I'm thinking, hey, you're going to be thrown in prison and tested, okay? And you'll experience suffering for 10 days. And look what Jesus says here. He doesn't say, I'm going to get you out of jail. He doesn't say, I'm going to take you out of jail. What's he say? Remain faithful even to the point of death. See, that's hard, isn't it? Because none of us want to be in prison. He says, remain faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life itself. See, he makes a promise to you. And I think it's important to this church at Smyrna, if you stay faithful, even through the hard times, he's got you. And I could talk about the history of this church and everything else, but I think the most powerful part of this whole part of Scripture is what he's saying to the believers. What he's saying to you as a believer is, you're going to face persecution, you're going to face trial. Stand with God. Stop making, don't feel sorry for yourself. Stand with God. Remain faithful. Part of faithfulness is having joy in the Lord, right? Right? You're supposed to have joy in the Lord, right? It's not easy when you're going through trials to have joy in the Lord, is it? You're going to walk out of here today. I guarantee some of you are going to be stuck in traffic, okay? And you're here, though, right? I say this every time. You're here. You should be having joy because you're at the place that a lot of people want to be, right? So praise God. As you walk out of here, one of the things you have to realize is that this is not all that we have. There is something in store for us that's so much greater. He says, I'm going to give you a crown of life. He's going to crown you, okay? That crown that is life itself. He's going to put it on your head and say, you're mine. And then we're going to finish with verse 11 this morning. He said, the one who has ears had better hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You got it? He's saying this again. Listen. I don't know if any of you have had kids that didn't listen, right? But my mom had enough kids that I heard her, her life before she passed away say, listen, probably a million times. She said, well, you just listen. Okay, right? Just listen. He's saying, to the one who has ears, had better hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will in no way be harmed by the second death. What's he talking about with the second death here? See, there's a first death, right? What's the first death? It's spiritual death. You got that? But see, the second death is to be cast into the lake of, of fire, okay? To be separated from God eternally. If you don't have Christ, guess where you wind up? Right? You're going to wind up in the second death. The second death is for those who don't trust in God. He says, look, he says, you'll in no way be harmed by the second death. So that you have assurance, okay, that you are with who? Christ. You got that? Nothing. 
nothing can harm you. You got that? All the things that are going on in your life, all the things that are horrible, all the things that may be unspeakable, that may be hard to deal with, he's saying, you know what? If you stand with me, you don't have anything to worry about. I might not deliver you from these issues right now, but there's a time coming. You know what? You're not going to be touched by the second death. You're going to be standing right with him. Isn't that a beautiful picture? See, as a Christian, you should go out here this morning. Man, I got great. Okay, great. I'm walking out here this morning, and this is a great day. I've, I came to church. I'm worshiping. I'm going to go out. I'll probably have something to eat, probably do some things. I've got the opportunity to enjoy today. Am I going to enjoy today? Just today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just today, right? Be the Christian that God wants you to be today. You got that? Share the love of God with other people today. Don't say, I'll do it tomorrow. Don't wait till tomorrow. But do it today. When you walk out of here, give somebody a hug. Tell somebody that you care about them. Pray for somebody. When people ask you to pray, stop and pray right then. You got it? When people say, I need prayer, pray. Don't say, okay, I'll remember. And then you forget when you get home. Okay? Look, be the one that when people see, why do you have that hope? I have that hope because I have Christ. Every single one of us are blessed because the best thing is we can walk out of here. We can walk up the beach, watch the waves, right? You can feel that air come off the ocean, which is good. You're blessed. Praise God and give him all the glory for the blessings you got. You got that? And if you're miserable, please tell, don't tell them you went here this morning. Okay? If you go out to eat, if you go somewhere, don't tell them you visited here. Tell them you went to the Catholic church. Okay? Please. Just tell them, yeah, we were at Catholic Mass this morning. It was unreal. Okay? But don't tell them you went here. If you're happy, tell them that you came here. But if you're miserable, tell them, man, that Catholic church. Okay? You got it? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what a great and awesome God you are. We thank you for the power of your word, who you are, what you're capable of doing, Lord. We pray for our hearts that we would understand the way that you've talked to the churches so far, that, Lord, we need to look at ourselves and evaluate ourselves. Lord, may we be like those people that you want us to be, obedient and loving. Lord, may we not have left our first love. May we focus on you and love you with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our soul. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So Pam and George are going to lead us one last song, and then we'll, we'll close. And don't forget, you're welcome to join us afterwards. We have some coffee and cake in the back. <laughs> when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise And the morning of his resurrection share When his chosen one shall gather to their home beyond the shore And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll 
called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Amen. Hallelujah. So as you close this morning, I just want to remind you, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is the opportunity. We're going to pray this morning, and, and this is just a time to say, look, if, if you've never accepted him, just ask Jesus to come in your heart, forgive you for the sins that you've committed, and realize that he does that. He not only takes them away, washes you void of snow, and that you're a new creation in him. So this morning, we're going to pray that. We're also going to pray for any of the issues or problems you may have. We can lay it up before God. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. We pray for those who may not know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we ask this morning that um, they would just say, Lord, I need you. That I need you in my heart. I need you to wash me and make me clean, white as snow. And that, Lord, you would do that. That you would move in power. Lord, we just pray for those who haven't been touched by you, that you would meet them right there. Lord, we pray for those who have physical, spiritual, emotional, financial needs. That, Lord, you would just meet us right where we need to be met this morning. That, Lord, we cast them at your feet. We know we're supposed to cast our cares upon you, and we're doing that this morning. We come before you, Lord, and we're asking for you to move. Move in power. We ask that you would just move amongst us as we go out of this place, that we would show the love of God to one another. We ask this all in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Guys, please stay and join us this morning. God bless you. Have a great morning.